Shabbat Shalom. 2,500 years ago, and then again 2,000 years ago, the holy temples in Jerusalem were destroyed. They were burned to the ground, people were exiled, killed, tortured. Was it good for the Jews? Do you think the destruction of the holy temples was good for the Jews? Well, I see some head nods. Well, you know, destruction is never really a good thing. But now we don't have animal sacrifices anymore, which is probably not such a bad thing. Was it good for the Jews? Maybe I'll ask a different question. 2,500 years ago and then 2,000 years ago, the holy temples were destroyed. Was it God's will that that happened? Did God make that happen? The Talmud certainly teaches that God made it happen. After all, the first temple was destroyed, the Talmud teaches, because of sins against God, because of idol worship. The second temple was destroyed, our Talmud teaches, because of sins against each other, because of how Jews treated other Jews. The Talmud makes very clear that the destruction of the first and second temple is a direct result of our actions and a direct punishment by God. So let me ask you now, by a show of hands, how many of you think that the destruction of the first and second temples were God's will? Okay. A goodly variety. Now, obviously we know the downside of that. What is the upside of the destruction of the first and second temples? We created an entire religion independent of statehood. Judaism as we know it is a rabbinic Judaism, right? not a biblical Judaism. And that was a direct result of the expulsion from the land of Israel. The Jews' commitment to caring for others in the way that we do, the Jews' commitment to remembering what it feels like to be mistreated and oppressed, exiled, is a direct result of the destruction of the first and second temples. So maybe it was good for the Jews. Fast forward a thousand years after that, you have the Crusades. Right? And there's much in our rabbinic literature about how the Crusades are again a punishment for the Jews' failure to properly observe Judaism. How many of you think the Crusades were a direct result of God's actions? Okay. Were they good for the Jews? Were they bad for the Jews? Fast forward again to the 18th century, the 19th century, and even the early 20th century. All of those millions of Jews in Russia and Eastern Europe who were forced out because of the Cossack and other pogroms, they were forced out of the Pale of Settlement. They were forced out of that poverty. They were forced out of that desolate living situation. And where did most of them come? Here. The United States of America to create arguably the most prosperous Jewish community in 2,000 years. And where did those who didn't end up here go? By and large, they went to Eretz Israel and became the early Chalutzim, the pioneers that settled the land of Israel. So how many of you think that maybe the pogroms of the, 19th, the 18th, 19th, and 20th century are a direct result of God's will. Some. Fast forward to the mid-20th century. The Holocaust. 1939 to 1945. Dare we say that that was a direct result of God's will as well? There are those among us, the, typically the ultra-right-wingers, who would say to you, where was Reform Judaism born? What's the answer? Where was Reform Judaism born? Germany. Where was the Holocaust born? Was the Holocaust a direct result of God's will? Fast forward to summer of 2017. A hurricane into Texas. An earthquake in Mexico. 
a hurricane now coming up into Florida. A direct result of God's will. It is said that comedy equals tragedy plus time. Can you say the same thing about theology? Does theology equal tragedy plus time? We're willing to say and we're willing to give in that maybe the first and the second holy temples were indeed destroyed as a result of God's will. Maybe even the crusades will go in that direction as well. Maybe we'll say the crusades were direct as God's will and part of God's plan to get us ultimately here and to Eretz Yisrael. But can we say the same thing about the Russian Revolution? Maybe. About the Holocaust? No. Certainly not about the hurricanes or the earthquake. Perhaps theology is also tragedy plus time. And so it is that we are challenged by our Torah portion this week, Parshat Kitavo, and I'll invite all of you to open your Eitz Chaim Chumashim with me, please. If you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 27, I am on page uh, 1147. 1147. We are challenged by what is known as the Deuteronomic theology. Why bad things happen to good people? The answer is because maybe they're not good. And so it is that our Torah comes to teach, cursed be anyone who makes a sculptured or molten image. Cursed be one who insults his father or his mother. Cursed be one who moves his fellow's countryman's landmark. Cursed be one who misdirects a blind person. Cursed be one who subverts the rights of the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you can flip. There are lots of curses. Curses if we don't follow the mitzvot. Curses if we fail to live according to God's way. Cursed be he who will not uphold the terms of this teaching and observe them, the Torah says. And all of our ancestors said amen. But if we obey God, if we listen to God, if we follow the mitzvot and we observe the commandments, then good things will happen. And here I am on page 1149. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the issue of your womb, the produce of your soil. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be in your comings, and blessed shall you be in your goings. But then the Torah comes back again and says, wait. Yes, there's lots of blessing to be had, but there's lots of curse too. And again, on page 1151, we come back to the curses. If you fail to follow the commandments, cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the issue of your womb and the produce of your soil. Cursed shall you be in your comings, and cursed shall you be in your goings. Deuteronomy makes very clear that when tragedy happens, there ought not to be a question as to why or how it happened. Deuteronomy happens as a direct result of God's will. When we fail to observe the mitzvot, Why were the first and second temple destroyed according to the book of Deuteronomy? Because we failed to serve God and to care for our fellow man. Why did the crusades happen according to the book of Deuteronomy? Because we failed to serve God and we failed to care for our fellow man. Why did the pogroms of Russia happen? Because we failed to serve God and we failed to care for our fellow man. Why did the Holocaust happen? Because we failed to serve God. And because we've failed to care for our fellow man, six million Jews, including a million kids? Why are the hurricanes and the earthquakes happening of today? Have we failed to serve God properly? Have we failed to care for our fellow man? It's challenging theology. It's difficult to accept. Now again, maybe tragedy plus time allows us to digest the book of Deuteronomy a little more easily. But even our ancestors were challenged and struggled with this idea of direct curse and direct blessing from God as a direct result of our actions. And so it is that the prophet Isaiah, 
gave a somewhat different approach to why bad things happen. Isaiah gives us the lesson of the suffering servant. Isaiah comes to say that the Jewish people suffer in order to teach the rest of the world how to behave. For the prophet Isaiah, why might the Holocaust have happened? Why might the pogroms of Russia have happened? In order to teach the world how to care for each other. In order to teach the world how to break down the walls that divide us. In order to teach the world how to not judge others. Do you feel better about that? Do you like that explanation better as to why bad things happen? We suffer in order to teach the world? How does that speak to the individual? The person with cancer? The person with the heart attack? The person who loses everything in the midst of the hurricane? Am I suffering in order to teach another? And so it is that we come to another explanation in the Bible, the book of Job. Job, of course, it says, is a righteous man who loses everything, his family, his property, all that belongs to him. And Job has the opportunity to stand one-on-one -on -one before God and say, what gives? How could you do this to me? And what does God say to Job? Who are you? Who are you to try to understand my ways? I'm God. You are a mere mortal. Frankly, I like the book of Job the best. Who am I to try to understand? And so it is that we come to a small part in our Torah portion this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 29, the very end of our parsha. I'm on page 1158. Now after the whole blessings and curses phenomenon, our rabbis tried to end the parsha on a higher note. And so they included this little bit of Deuteronomy 29 in the end. And you see it says that Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your very eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his courtiers and to his whole country, the wondrous feats that you saw with your own eyes, those prodigious signs and marvels. Yet to this day the Lord has not given you a mind to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. Yet it wasn't until today that you could really begin to understand. The Israelite who felt the Egyptians chasing them from behind was not in that moment giving thanks to God for the great miracle of redemption. He was afraid for his life. And he was annoyed that the guy in front of him was moving so slowly and smelled so bad and was so dirty because in the midst of the tragedy, that's all you can see. What is immediately behind you and what is immediately in front of you. And it's not until some time goes by that maybe, just maybe, we can begin to make sense of some of the sadness in this world. The very next verse says, I led you through the wilderness 40 years. As a result, Rashi, the great medieval commentator, comes to teach that it's not until one attains the age of 40 that he or she can even begin to understand the world. And perhaps we can also understand in Rashi's commentary that maybe it is not until at least 40 years after an event can one truly begin to make sense and process it. So where are you in your theology? Why do bad things happen? Is it because of Deuteronomy? Because we must have done something wrong? The individual who suffers, the nation that suffers, they must have done something wrong? Perhaps it's Isaiah. Perhaps you agree that those who suffer are put on earth in order to teach lessons to others. Perhaps you're with Job and you say, I don't and I never will really understand why bad things happen. There is yet another teaching that I wrestle with. There's a story of Rabbi Nachum. Rabbi Nachum is also known in our tradition as Rabbi Nachum Ish Gamzu. Because whenever tragedy befell, Rabbi Nachum's response was Gamzu Litova. 
This too, for good. He had such faith in God, such faith in a divine plan, that whatever tragedy befell, he said, Gamzu Litova, this too shall be for good. So the story is told that here it was 2,000 years ago, the Israelites were suffering under the oppressive thumb of the Romans. And it happened to come to be the Caesar's birthday. And so our ancestors got the idea that they should send a wonderful gift to the Caesar. So they packed up all this incredible treasure, fine linens and gold and jewelry, and they put it in a large chest and gave it to Rabbi Nachum and said, Rabbi Nachum, surely God will not let anything happen to you. You are among the most righteous of us. And they sent Rabbi Nachum on his way. Now on his way to Rome, Rabbi Nachum with his treasure happened to spend one night at an inn. And it was he fell asleep that robbers broke into his room, took the treasure, secreted it away, hid all of this treasure behind a wall, and replaced the treasure with sand to fill the chest so that Rabbi Nachum would never notice that his treasures were missing. And sure enough, Rabbi Nachum takes his treasure chest to Rome, presents it to Caesar on behalf of the Israelites. Caesar opens the chest, and you can only imagine his horror and his anger when he sees, this, this is what the Israelites brought me, a chest of sand. How dare you? And what, what was Rabbi Nachum's answer to him? Gamzu Tova, this too shall be for good. And so it is that the Caesar threw the rabbi into the dungeons and began talking with his men. And Caesar's men told him, I hear a legend that even the sands of the Jewish people can be turned into daggers and swords by their Lord. So it is that Caesar decided to put it to the test, and in one of his military campaigns, he brings out this chest of sand that was brought to him by Rabbi Nachum. And he throws the sand up in the air, and what happens? God brings a miracle. The sand turns into swords and daggers, destroys the Caesar's enemy. And sure enough, he says, let Rabbi Nachum go. The Israelites are a wonderful people. Let's ease their burden and help give them some peace. Rabbi Nachum is known as Ish Gamzu, the man who said in the face of a tragedy, Gamzu Litova, this, all of this that we feel, this tragedy, this sadness, this suffering that we feel now will in the end be for good. Do you believe that? The destruction of the temples, the crusades, the Russian pogroms, the Holocaust, the hurricanes, and the earthquake? Are you ready to say, Gamzu Litova, this too shall be for good? Or perhaps we remember that theology, like comedy, equals tragedy plus time. I have no good answers for you this week. But this week of Parashat Kitavo, we are challenged to recognize the suffering that exists in this world. We're challenged to respond to it no matter where we feel God played a role in that suffering. We're challenged to open our hands and open our hearts to all those who are in need. Whether it be as a result of an individual crisis, a hurricane or an earthquake, or an old man who survived the Holocaust. This week of Parashat Ki Tavo, let us wrestle with God, but let us be especially kind to each other. Kenya Hiratzon, may this be God's will, and let us say together.